So this is a talk about uh, in-memory technology and memory databases. And uh, uh, it's uh, also about parental architecture. And a parental is an in-memory database. So, and uh, I'm a CTO of this uh, product. I do the development, uh, uh, documentation, ev evangelizing everything related to Toronto. So, uh, spoiler, uh, you can try this out, try out Toronto for free. Uh, it's, uh, you can try it online. Um, all the technical content on this uh, talk is going to be is, is actually available at uh, my GitHub page. And uh, the idea of this talk was uh, uh, was born when people tried to compare in memory technology and uh, and uh, traditional databases. They started to say, hey, why do I need an in-memory database? Why can't I just take uh, every, everything that I have and uh, put in memory. So I have my SQL or Oracle or whatever and just give it more memory. So the idea of this talk is to explain the difference between in-memory database technology and disk-based database technology. Explain why there is a window of, of opportunity in today for a new database. So uh, the story began when I used to be a MySQL developer and uh, I joined this new company seven years ago. Uh, it was new for me, but it had quite a few uh, highly loaded database instances uh, running in production by the time and it was MySQL. And I w used to be a MySQL developer and, and they asked me, could we tune this a little bit so that we can go get more queries from MySQL? And uh, uh, they were using my MySQL for 100% memory resident data set. Yet they had to partition their data set because uh, MySQL could only give you maybe 50,000 queries per second. And they needed 400,000 queries per second. Uh, so they had to partition and replicate their data set simply because they couldn't cope with the load. And at first it was very surprising to me because I mean, what does it take to just uh, take data which is in memory, entire memory resident, update it and so on. And, uh, 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 and I started tuning it. And since I was an internals kind of guy, I, was, I applied very you know, serious tuning to my SQL, yet we were unable to tune it to the level, for, for example, of memcached. So a memcached could give more queries per second from the same data set than MySQL, but memcached of course wasn't persistent and this was seven years ago. So then I uh, uh, started looking at uh, how do we actually provide persistency for memcached and uh, uh, implemented the first version of this product which was seven years ago. So, and uh, you know, there is a whole uh, kind of religious literature which is, which is called apologetics, when you actually apologize for something that is already, has already happened. So this kind of talk is, a, this kind of, is, a, is an apologetical talk. I'm trying to explain why this actually works, why we were able to save on hardware and then get, get, get all the performance gains from using an in-memory technology compared to this based technology. And for those who joined a bit later, I, I will repeat, I, I started earlier because my flight is just in a couple of hours. So if you have any questions, by the way, uh, just go ahead and ask because we won't have time for questions. <laughs> and I like getting questions as I speak, so I will take them. And also for those who joined a bit later, as a spoiler, you can read some of my stuff at Costa GitHub, or this is my blog. And uh, this is where you can try out Toronto right away. It's like online, uh, so don't waste your time, just try it. So uh, there's this, this paper, it's a very famous paper, which is called, uh, it's time for, I think it's, uh, 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 it's been known for it's time for a complete rewrite. Uh, so it's a study 
made in 2008 and many uh, refer to this study, which shows that most of the work uh, the, which is done by sort of traditional relational databases is spent on useless stuff. So only 12% of the work which is done processing transaction is spent on uh, updating the indexes, searching in an index, and doing, doing this, this kind of things, so actually changing the data. And the rest of the work is either spent on locking, which is a logical locking, we will talk about this for transaction isolation, latching, which is a physical locking, like uh, concurrency related locking, and you have concurrent threads or processes working with the same data set. Index management and uh, buff buffer management, which is about updating the secondary keys and uh, maintaining the buffer pools and things like that. So caching, basically. So, so this actually, uh, this short slide already explains that there is a 10x window of opportunity for in-memory technology compared to disk-based technology. So the whole point of my talk is actually explain how this uh, 10x opportunity can be exploited and how you can further gain 20x performance gains if you also apply careful engineering principles. So in this talk, I, I'm trying to get from top to bottom, from bird eye view to the gory details of the implementation. By explaining the, some of the design choices on the top level, I go down to the engineering problems and then I go down to the data structures and explain how we can you know, cut a little here, cut a little there, and then gain all this uh, streamlined database performance which you can get from the database. So, uh, if you go back to the sort of ground rules for databases, I believe that it's, uh, they, they are this, it, it, it is ACID. So any database that is claiming that it's not ACID and you should you know, leave it that is, in my opinion, bullshitting you. I mean, sorry for, for, for this uh, kind of rough uh, evaluation, but uh, and the reason I think so is that uh, I believe all these various consistency levels, uh, you know, eventual consistency, cap theorems, they are for geeks. And if you want to write efficient applications, you need some strong guarantees and some simplicity of understanding of what the database is doing. So for, you know, for large, like the masses of developers, ACID defines sort of the rules of the game. If you want to implement a database, you have to think how you would make it ACID. And if you go back to, to the original designs of databases, like IBM System R, and the whole isolation theory uh, was born at, at that time, then you learn that uh, the engineers of the time had to deal with two difficult problems. Uh, these are what, this was slow clients and slow devices. So the database of the databases of the past would try to multiplex work of multiple clients over a slow device. So they, their main idea was that to provide concurrency. Uh, and uh, concurrency is when you run parallel transactions on the same data, and they are logically parallel, but they are physically, you know, they work with a slow device. Another observation is that the databases of that time uh, they were dealing mainly with ad hoc transactions. What is an ad hoc transaction? It's like when somebody literally tie, is typing a transaction on a computer terminal. So you do not know in advance uh, what sort of uh, transaction you're going to deal with. And if you compare it with today, uh, most of the time, of course not always because you have, uh, you know, analytics, BI, when you're actually looking for something new, but most of the OLTP, all of your transactions are actually hardwired into your application. You write this, them down when you write the application, or it's even a stored procedure, so it's even easier than that. So if we try to understand the, you know, the, the databases of the old times, we need to uh, uh, like look at them from the perspective, from this perspective. And uh, uh, based on that, there is a whole concurrency theory which uh, sort of, uh, and uh, which main you know theorem is a two-phase locking theorem. So to maintain this isolation, you need to lock data. So actually, generally speaking, if you have concurrency, you need some way to communicate between your concurrent entities 
that hey, somebody else is working on the same uh, on the same role. Somebody else is reading it or writing it. Only in this case, you can you know understand whether uh, the changes that different agents are making to the database could be uh, consistent. And consistency is uh, actually very well defined. Simply put. Everybody got to look at the database and see it as if he was alone, you know, as nobody else was uh, was working at the database at the same time. Every transaction is operating in isolation. So, in, and as a result, you get the consistent results. So, uh, and now when we try to uh, sort of uh, analyze, uh, like, how we let me let me put it differently. So. Um, after the two-phase locking theorem, and after most of the row-level locking engines that we had like 10, 20 years ago, uh, MVCC became a mainstream. But if you now look at MVCC, uh, it, 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 by default, out of the box, it provides snapshot isolation. It doesn't provide serializable isolation level. To make MVCC serializable, by the way, does anybody need, the, need to explain what MVCC is? Pretty advanced crowd, isn't it? So we can just go on. So, so you still need to take logs. So logs are paramount. And uh, uh, for in memory, of course, I will show that you often can avoid all the locking altogether. So coming back to that picture, uh, uh, in memory databases are different because they don't need locking and latching. And this is almost 30% on this picture already. Now let's talk about. Uh, uh, buffer pool management and uh, uh, the other 50%, uh, 60% of the of the picture. So if you look at the traditional databases, uh, this is how they represent data usually. They are page. This is page oriented storage. You have variable size rows which uh, are fit into fixed size pages, and you need fixed size pages because you want to maintain work with the uh, you know device and. Uh, essentially deal with the fragmentation. So uh, you try to pack variable size data into fixed size, size uh, pages and you inevitably get uh, slack, empty space. Now you try to put this in memory. Mm. Uh, you essentially, whenever you cache your disk-based database, you also cache the slack. So. Uh, we often see in our deployments, when you take a data which is stored, say, in MySQL, you put it into Toronto, and it takes less in RAM and less on disk because you don't have this. And uh, you, you, you can't, I mean, I mean, the problem of paging is really hard to deal with. Log structures, merge trees, they work with it a little bit more efficiently, but they, they have other kind of slack. They have uh, more, they represent data in multiple versions, so they have store, store garbage, essentially. And you if you cache LS entries, you also potentially uh, cache garbage. So disk-based database, essentially, they optimize around uh, making I.O. them disk I.O. efficient. Memory-based databases have a different goal. They can optimize around memory consumption, and the less memory you consume, the more efficient is your CPU cache, and the more efficient is your CPU cache, the faster is your database. Another example, uh, when, when we compare disk-based database and memory-based database is secondary keys. And usually, uh, by the way, was anyone tracking uh, this uh, paper uh, from Uber about, a, about PostgreSQL? Was anybody reading this? So a couple of people. So they actually uh, d decided that PostgreSQL is not good for them because of the way PostgreSQL maintains secondary keys, one of the major reasons. And PostgreSQL, the, the way secondary keys is, is, in, uh, PostgreSQL is uh, organized in PostgreSQL is that you store a physical address of the, of the row in the secondary key file, essentially, in secondary key page. So whenever you change the value, uh, whenever you change the, the record, update the record, create a new version of the record, you have to update all of the secondary keys, which creates a lot of work for I.O. So in this, if you then replicate it, it creates a lot of work for replication and so on. So I'm talking about physical replication, now, not logical. So in a memory database, your secondary key index essentially stores pointers to data. You don't have to store uh, uh, co 
copies, uh, any co a copy of data, because memory is directly addressable. You don't have to think about, you know, relative addressing or file offsets and anything like that. So this gives you another advantage because your in-memory database is more memory efficient. And the third uh, sort of uh, source of opportunity is the, is the parallel computing of the past compared to parallel computing of the present. In the past, caches were small. Uh, the amount of work a CPU would do under the hood was negligible. Most of the time you would understand uh, what is happening. Uh, every instruction would be, uh, you know, would, you would know how many CPU uh, ticks it's going to take. Nowadays, any instruction can take <laughs> pretty much arbitrary number of CPU ticks. Uh, I have a test task for, you know, for interns in the project, and I'm asking them, and giving them a simple assembly code, and, I, and I'm, I'm asking which instruction in this code is the slowest one. It's going to take infinite amount of time, and they're like, looking at the instructions and trying to understand them, and in the end of the day, it all boils down to paging. So if your if your if your memory access can uh, you know page you out swap you out, then your instruction can take an infinite amount of time, and uh, so memory accesses are very important. And when we talk about con concurrency, we need is when your data is RAM resident, you need to make sure that your uh, concurrency doesn't screw up your cache ca your caching. So you don't uh, if you we scroll a bit forward. Uh, if you look at, uh, just a sec. Yeah, so if you look at the at the, a chip of today, uh, it's this is the amount of uh, space on chip that is dedicated to caching. And this is the way it's organized. When you, when you look at the chip, uh, you, there is a message bus which is used among, um, uh, by all of the cores to actually access the cache. There is a protocol, it's called the Messy protocol, which allows you to concurrently modify the same uh, cache record from different cores. But uh, the, the essence of this protocol is that in order to write to, to, C, to CPU cache, you need to communicate among cores. You need to send messages on the bus. So the uh, less messages you can send, the, essentially the less shared data you use in your application, the faster is your application. Uh, the less messages you send, the less locks you take, because a locks, uh, locks can be you know, a memory barrier, and a memory barrier means that you, your cache is screwed again, so if you take a memory bar barrier. Uh, so let's get back to the solution that is uh, uh, addressing all of these issues, and can provide you know, a framework on which we can then build a modern database. The idea is simple. We make 100% of data RAM resident, but we partition data among cores right away so that a single core is responsible for its own piece of data. This is, so essentially you begin, you, you say, hey, we need to be horizontally scalable. Let's not be, use machines for horizontal scale, scaling. We, let's use cores for horizontal scaling. Then a single core is, you know, is the king of its data. It doesn't need any locking, latching. Uh, well, you still may need locking if you run, if you run so-called interactive transactions, but for many transactions which are run on a single core, a stored procedure transactions can get exclusive access to the RAM, and uh, uh, they don't need any, any locking either. So you don't need latching because a single thread is responsible for a single uh, piece of memory, and you, in, of, in, in many cases, you don't need any locking or concurrency control because you just give a transaction exclusive access to the to the RAM, let it run, and then execute the next transaction. So these transactions are called sta static transactions, but we do still have a problem, and uh, uh, this problem is called persistency. Right? You could probably uh, access memory in this way, in this uh, you know sequential way, but you still need to write these changes to RAM to disk because otherwise you don't have any persistency. So, uh, and uh, if you do it in a naive way, uh, you hit a bottleneck because your disk is still slow. You know it takes milliseconds to write to disk. So uh, what you could do 
to solve this. Yeah, and the, here is also an important example. Like everybody here is talking about performance. Performance, performance, uh, and uh, nobody actually I don't understand or means something different by performance. So I understand two words, latency and throughput. These are pretty clear words to me. Like your latency is how much time it takes to process a transaction. And your throughput is uh, how many transactions per second you can run. So latency, uh, these are two different things and together they define performance. So you can, you can have a very fast database, you can optimize for latency and or you can optimize for throughput and with the, and then again you can optimize for the best case or you can optimize for the worst case so these things are important what is your 99.9 percent .9 latency is it a few milliseconds is it you know a hundred milliseconds it all depends on your on many things including uh, your storage your your memory organization whether you collect garbage or not whether you swap things out or not and so on so uh, with write ahead logging, it's the same thing. We can have a high throughput, but we cannot physically achieve low latency lower than a device can give to us. If you know, if it takes uh, 10 milliseconds to write to the device, then every transaction has to wait for this 10 milliseconds, but still we can run many transactions concurrently and use group commit to batch this out to the device. So that's the basic idea. And uh, with uh, applied uh, to the Previous uh, design principles, it means that we take a transaction, let it run, queue it up for a disk write, for logging, and then start another transaction, and then another one, and then another one. So we, uh, essentially, this is a form of pipelining, and I uh, use this picture to, to describe this uh, kind of pipelining. So there is a slow device, and there is a, uh, you know, a mass transit system when you have uh, you know, a train going back and forth between uh, in memory and the disk, and it takes a batch of writes and logs them to the disk and goes back and takes a batch of writes. Then you have the network, which is similarly, you know, all of the clients are sending queries from the network then. So, uh, so this is exactly, this is the, basically the picture we uh, describe in Toronto architecture it is three threads, every instance is three threads. The, the central thread is doing all the transaction processing. The write ahead log thread is doing the logging and replication and everything like that. And the network thread is dealing with the you know, logical, logical parsing and uh, checking the, the input, working with the clients, working with the sockets, and they communicate over a high speed, uh, you know, not high speed, high throughput. Uh, messaging buses. So uh, coming back to uh, the write ahead log problem, still there is a gotcha in this design. The gotcha is this, that what happens when you actually fail to write to the write ahead log? You already let if, if quite a few trans other transactions to proceed before you, you finished, uh, before your train came back to get the uh, previous transaction. So, you can end up in a situation, say, I'm using uh, this picture. This is a famous uh, art uh, movie, movie director, it's called, I think, from Russia. And uh, so this guy is looking, this is like a film tape, right? And there is a film which is, uh, which is synced to the device. It's somewhere here. There is a film that is being synced to the device. It's this. And there are new slides attached to this all of the time, you know, a, a, a tail. So imagine somewhere here, we encounter a disk write error. In this case, we need to essentially throw away the entire tail of the film because we have allowed the transactions in which have seen the inconsist potentially inconsistent state. We have not yet sent okay to the client about for these transactions, but we have already processed them. So what we do is like reverse, uh, reverse, uh, reverse the film, we, we, we play the film back. We start from rolling back the last transaction, then the next, the next one, the next one, the next one, before we can cut off the end of the film. This is called in literature cascading rollback. So you cascade all of the changes so that you can rewind the database to the consistent state again. But uh, uh, one needs to understand that with this uh, 
well, cascading rollback is potentially very expensive. You know, you can roll, roll back thousands of transactions if you have high velocity, uh, you know, uh, throughput with the database. But uh, on the other hand, cascading rollback may happen with Tarantal only if you have a disk, a physical error. All the consistency check are happening before this. So if a transaction is conflicting for any other reason, it's rolled back before. So it's a very rare event. Essentially, it's a you know it's a you know a no disk space or any any physical event which may happen. And this uh, actually exemplifies a major design principle of Tarantula is when you optimize for the uh, fast case, you don't optimize for errors. So an error can be expensive. So this concludes the first part, and uh, these are the basic design principle principles with which we can go to the engineering principles. By the way, do you have any questions? Can we, yeah. Exactly, so uh, the question was, whether the system is optimized uh, for short transactions. Indeed, it is. It's uh, high velocity, uh, we call it fast data. So it's something that can change entirely. Your entire data set can change in one hour, in one day. And, uh, uh, but you still, uh, high volume of transactions. You need to process hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So, uh, but uh, actually also to address this, with MVCC, you still can run uh, uh, run analytical queries against this, uh, but uh, uh, the fact that we run a transaction processor, the right thread is single, doesn't mean that you can have many V threads. So you can have more V threads which are accessing the same data, but there is a single right thread. Uh, so before I go to engineering, uh, there is a, you know also sort of a pitch that there are some kind of universal databases. You know, a database which is bought, which is, has so many features. Yes, please. So uh, in Toronto, a read-only transaction may encounter this situation. A read-write transaction never encounters this because it also is queued up and it is uh, rollback and cascade before it actually gets an okay from the client, uh, an okay sent to the client. So the client is going to get the rollback in this case. But if you just read read uh, the data, and, uh, yeah. So technically, we could uh, simply push all the read transactions through this system. They would not. Uh, leave any footprint in a write ahead log, but we don't do it, we don't have any request for this, essentially, from the community, from the users. So, uh, coming back to the uh, engineering, with engineering, uh, it's uh, important to understand what you optimize for. And we had this uh, initial conditions when we were, when we had a very rel relatively slow network, relatively fast network, and I will give you numbers, and uh, uh, our goal was to provide a predictable latency. So we were optimizing for, uh, given this pre preliminary condition, we were optimizing for throughput. With predictable latency, give maximal throughput possible. What it means in practice? In practice, you, every transaction you run against Toronto returns, uh, you know, in, in a matter of milliseconds, in a matter of getting the data synced to disk. But other than that, uh, the shared costs, which you, and I will show what kind of costs these are. The shared cost of transactions is minimized with high, the, the higher is the throughput, the lower is the shared cost that transactions bear when they execute. Uh, let me explain. Imagine you have uh, three threads, and this is a network thread. Uh, it reads a request from network, it takes, you know, a, a few, maybe 100 nanoseconds to read, to use a system call to read the request. Then there is a queue for incoming request to be between two threads. So this thread is sending a message in this queue and while the, it waits for response, it is yielded, it is, it suspend, suspends. 
So then it, uh, a context switch takes place, and the context switch is already you know up to a thousand nanoseconds, so it may, it may be even more. It depends. So a thousand nanoseconds uh, later, this thread is activated. It reads the query. It takes him. Uh, it takes this guy maybe another few thousand of nanoseconds to uh, create a transaction, execute an update or insert or delete, update an in-memory data structure, and queue up for a write to the write to head log. So and then this thread is suspended. And then the write ahead log kicks in and takes this thing and writes to the device. And it's also another, maybe uh, you know, a few thousand nanoseconds uh, for logical, some, some useful work, and a few thousand nanoseconds for context switching. So as you can see, you know, if you have only a few transactions in the pipeline at the moment, at this every single time, then your overhead for context switching is high. But now imagine, uh, you know, you maybe spend a few thousand nanoseconds doing useful work, another few thousand doing the switching. But now imagine you have a, a thousand transactions at a time, in, at, at any given time in the queue. Then you start operating in batches. Uh, working with the queue still takes the same thousand, or even maybe less because all the threads are active at all times. But processing transactions is already takes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of nanoseconds. So this is how you actually, with higher throughput, you, you can share the costs of uh, transaction processing among uh, many transactions. And this is how you achieve highest performance possible for high throughput. So if you optimize for latency, maybe the entire architecture is wrong. Maybe you need to have a single thread per connection. You need log-free data structures and uh, things like that. So does it, and maybe you need to, to run things in process and, and so on. So understanding what you're optimized for is, is paramount and be optimized for fairly good latency and highest throughput possible. So once you actually decided what you optimize for, you need expression, you need languages, you need means to write this code. And uh, uh, basically these are the choices for concurrent, uh, concurrent programming nowadays. You could use Scala or you could use Erlang or you could do something of your own. We chose C and C++, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, but having chosen C and C++, we uh, started looking at the models, programming models uh, for implementing the, uh, the, the, all of these concurrency things. Because, I mean, if you go back to this, there is an entity for every transaction in every level, in every thread. And uh, if you don't organize, the, organize these entities in your code, then your code is spaghetti and you can't essentially implement uh, reliable uh, re reliable uh, database this way. So uh, I will not look at uh, the uh, all of these alternatives in detail. Uh, the main point I'm trying to make is that actor model is uh, is uh, a good balance between safety, efficiency, and uh, clarity of code. If you look at locking, it's uh, uh, you know, lockings are, locks are not composable. That's their, my main problem. You start using locking in your application, then your performance profile changes and suddenly your locks become hotspots. You start ch chasing hotspots, you add more locks, you start to deal, deal with the, you know, all of these other effects of locking. So, so compatibility is a big deal. Hardware, trans hard hardware transactional memory, we are waiting for it. We will probably work well on it, but for now, the best thing to use was an actor model and the fact that we have so many new languages, new, for example, Go, uh, Scala, and others uh, who support actor model means that, you know, this is the thing to do. This is the thing for concurrency. And the uh, actor model is also good for this picture, for the CPU, because actors means that uh, in order to deliver uh, you know, in order to do, to do concurrency, you need to deliver a message, and messaging works really well with the, with the you know, with uh, CPU cache because you don't explicitly access concurrent data. You send a message, which is which means creating a copy of the data. And uh, uh, 
I mean, you might ask me, why would you, why constitute you try, are trying to explain all of these details? So why, why are this, you know, explain why, uh, why uh, that actors are good? And this is actually the next thing what I'm getting to, just, just a sec. Mm. Uh, messaging. Yeah. Uh, it's this point. Uh, when we started, we uh, were only looking at uh, solving the main case, uh, high velocity, high throughput data changes. But then, uh, you know, people came to us and started asking for features, for stored procedures, for, you know, query language and so on. So the, what we did was to make our runtime, internal data as a runtime, which we, which we wrote ourselves, essentially, you know, a small operating system, within the process, uh, we made it available to the application developers. So we uh, created bindings for programming languages in which you can write extensions for the database runtime. And this is how we actually we ended up here. This is uh, eventually how we ended up being a data grid. So by uh, giving the uh, development environment, which is very efficient, which we know ourselves is going to be, is good for network accesses, for message passing, for file IO, we created a platform for application development, which is now available for uh, developers at large. So we essentially, we eat our own dog food and we supply this food to our community. Another thing with actor model is that now I remember why I was trying to roll back. So uh, I'm, I will just try to explain how it works with this uh, three-thread system. There is, for every transaction, we create an actor in every thread uh, that is participating in transaction processing. So if you run simultaneously like thousands of transactions per second, you're gonna have thousands of actors in every single thread. And we, every actor is a green, green thread in our case, is a fiber, so we implemented our own threads within the operating system threads. And uh, uh, so it makes it very easy for us to keep track of what's going on because essentially we have uh, fibers, uh, green threads exchanging messages between each other. There is no spaghetti code. Has anyone been programming with Node.js? No, Node.js no, Node users? <laughs> Funny, JavaScript uh, futures. Yeah, so JavaScript futures, uh, you know, you have to, it's in, uh, you have to change your thinking, change the paradigm. With fibers, we don't change the thinking. We just, every code is sequential. So if anything, uh, if, you know, if we need to, uh, if we need to suspend the execution of an actor, this happens under the hood, the scheduler kicks in and schedules another actor. So coming back to the story of uh, transaction processor, uh, there is an actor here which is reads from the socket. The read is blocking for the actor, but not blocking for, from the operate, operating system point of view. Then it processes the message and then sends the message uh, to the transaction control thread. The send of the message is uh, blocking for the actor, not blocking from the operating system point of view. And here is the same. S something that looks like a blocking operation is not blocking under the hood. Yes, so everything that works with network, sends messages and works with files can block. Yeah, that's the idea. So, uh, and uh, the reason I'm trying to, you know, put an emphasis on this is that we made this runtime available to developers. So uh, the uh, Toronto as a data grid provides you with the green threads, with, with the non-blocking IO, with file IO out of the box. And, uh, so, okay, let me skip, skip this for a little bit. Or no, let me just uh, describe this a little bit. So, um, there is a database called MemSQL. Has anyone heard about MemSQL? Yeah, a few. So, MemSQL core data structure is a concurrent skip list. 
and uh, uh, so it's a log-free data structure. It doesn't use mutexes, uh, but you can update it concurrently from multiple threads. Here we say we partition data and there is no concurrency within a partition. So I would like to compare these two approaches. Uh, concurrent skip list is a very neat data structure. Uh, if you try to implement, for example, a concurrent spatial index, it is already nearly impossible. A concurrent hash is there, but my point is that concurrency for data structures is a very difficult problem. By taking the approach that when we partition data, we actually allowed us, we have four types of indexes in Toronto, bit set, spatial index, R3, hash index, and B3. All these indexes are in memory. Indexes are easy to implement because they use a non-concurrent runtime. And if you wanted to implement an index, it's just a, you know, subclass in an existing class in Toronto code structure, and you use, with, use the existing framework to work with paging, work with persistency, and so on. So these are the trade-offs you make. And uh, having the, you know, laid down the groundwork for, with engineering principles, I will we cover a little bit the memory data structures that we use so that to explain, like, but to, it, this is more an, uh, an illustration that would, uh, my point would be to show that once you created some room uh, for yourself of opportunity, solving some difficult problems becomes not so hard because you, you actually thought a bit on a higher level. So since we uh, did not have any concurrency issues within the transaction processor, we were able to create uh, highly optimized memory management data structures to uh, process uh, changes to you know, memory data structures as fast as we can. If you take a traditional allocators, uh, they have uh, certain requirements that they need to, they need to fulfill and uh, uh, these are these requirements. So it's average fragmentation. It's, uh, they have to be able to allocate pretty much any amount of memory from four bytes to pretty much infinite amount. They have to be multi-threaded. You should be able to allocate memory in one thread and free it in another thread. We don't have any of this. But what we do have, uh, we need to rigorously enforce memory usage uh, rules. So if you define, like Toronto should use 10 gigabytes of RAM and not more, we should never exceed this amount, and yet we should be available even when we re hit the quota. So with Toronto, if you just uh, start shuffling data into it, and if you know you have no more RAM uh, to to store it, you simply get you know no space left on device. You know, but you can still read data. You can still work. Your selects still work, and uh, read queries work, deletes work. You can expire data and then go on. Uh, we needed uh, consistency support, so we needed a memory snapshot, multi-version concurrency control. So we created our own uh, uh, memory manager for this, and it's a hierarchical man memory manager. Uh, since the rental is BSD licensed, everything is available. Uh, it's open source. You can, you know, feel free to fork it. Uh, but here I want to talk about a single data structure, which is at, at the core of our. Uh, multi-versioning implementation. So, uh, yes, and I have very little time left, so I will probably wrap up quickly. So, in order to implement multi-versioning, you know, there is a write-ahead logging, which solves the persistency problem, but you still need to compact the write-ahead log. You still need to do checkpointing to speed up recovery. In order to do this, we implemented multi-version concurrency control, but we version uh, pages of memory. So the basic idea is that every address in Toronto, every physical address is translated into a logical address. And we have a translation table which uh, converts these two addresses. The, it's a very simple data structure. It uses a three, level, uh, three levels of tables. The top level table is first 11 bits in a logical address. And uh, they show you which you know, translation page you should use. The second is the address in the translation page and the, the third one is actually, uh, this is the second level translation page, and this is actual uh, address on the translation page which, where, where you get the physical address. So when we need to create a, you know, a read view of all, all our data, we simply freeze this data structure, 
copy on write is data structure. Does anyone, is anyone familiar with the copy on write principle? Yeah, so basically when you need to change it, you make a copy and only then change the copy. And uh, this, uh, and this thing is at the core of our uh, multi-versioning. Uh, taking it to the next step, uh, since we, we created a managed runtime for memory, we, since we have logical addresses for memory, what we can do is uh, background garbage collection and defragmentation uh, without actually affecting the data structures. So, uh, so imagine, uh, imagine you have, uh, your database is constantly working with changes, right? So imagine all of these changes make a form of the write ahead log, but in memory. What you can do then is, uh, uh, if you need to free some memory, you take the head of the write ahead log and start looking which of these is still relevant. Uh, most of this memory is probably junk at the point you you're trying to free it. You look at the pieces which are not junk. You move it forward in the write ahead log. You move it at the tail of the write ahead log. You rewrite the physical address, but you do not change any of the data structure, any of the index that is referring to this memory because you have this previous uh, system which enforces the address translation. You only change it in a single place. So this is the further development that we created for uh, efficient memory management. And since I'm out of time, I will probably drop the uh, data structures uh, review. Uh, an, important, an important point is that, uh, that not all trees are created equal, but uh, we probably ha will have to take it uh, at some later time, at some later venue. So to conclude, uh, let me skip the data structures. In memory databases are their own species. You don't get the 10x, 20x performance increase just by saying putting your data in memory, throwing in some data structures and, and so on. So uh, it took seven years for us to create a product that we are uh, you know, actively uh, continuing to develop and continue to promote today. Uh, it's, uh, it's all available as a, f as a free software. Uh, try this out and please uh, bug me with a few questions since we still have a few moments for questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you scale out beginning from the day one, as I mentioned in one of the first slides. Uh, you, what you do is message passing for scaling out. You run your application in multiple instances. You are forced to do that because a single instance is only just a, you know, a few tens of gigabytes. By default, every um, table you create at Toronto, and by table, I mean you know, classical table. We use it on our, our own word for table spaces because we store documents, not rows. But uh, every table you create, you define whether it's a local table or it's a partition table across many instances. So for a partition table, when you access a partition table, it's transparently accessing it on a different instance. But partition tables still come with a few limitations in Toronto. For example, uh, uh, partial key searches, iterators, they don't work as well with partition tables as with logical tables, with, with local tables. We have a protocol I mean, you have to, the short answer is no. So uh, we don't support them out of the box. We have a, pro, uh, Tarantul is, uh, is uh, an execution framework. You can write your, op or your own application. So we have more than, uh, well, maybe about 50 modules. Uh, half of this we created ourselves. Like a module is a package in a programming language. So. You can install a module just by saying, you know, Toronto CTL install, and then you take a module from the upstream. So uh, one of these modules does provide distributed transactions, uh, but not, not out of the box. Sure. Sure, yes, and uh, keep in mind that uh, we support master-master replication, 
we have now we have multiple storage answers. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So this is a this is a fairly mature product. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, you can. Used to be a problem a year ago. We implemented this maybe in October 2016. 